Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and today we're going to do part two of the ongoing series of, well, me sharing my armies with you and telling you some stories about them. Let's get into it. Uh, the strict technomancer that is Vinci V. Let us get to the technique and learn it Vinci V. So today we're going to cover three more armies and the theme of this week is big. Everything this week is big. When I say big, I mean big. Uh, now, so what three armies are we going to cover? Well, we're going to cover Sons of Bamot, some of the biggest models in AOS. We're going to cover uh, Ogres, known the world over for being big. And then we're also going to cover Imperial Knights. That's right, we're going to do a 40k army, because uh, that's a thing too. Uh, so, uh, let's uh, go ahead and take a look at some of these armies. Up first is the Sons of Bahamut. And really, this is one of my more favorite armies I've done. This army was incredibly fun to paint. Basic idea here was it, they are all sort of Frankensteinian monsters. They have been taken and captured and converted and scaled up. Or not scaled up, sorry. Um, yeah, I guess evolved, improved, upgraded. There we go. That's the right word. So I wanted to integrate a lot of machine parts and wires and infections and things like that. Uh, so let's take a look at them. We're going to start with the baby giants. Um, these, I have two, three packs of these. Um, there you have sort of thematic elements, as you'll see. These first ones are very weird. I just, I really went off the tracks with these. Um, you can see all the different elements. This was me getting out 40k bits and terrain bits and anything I could imagine and just stapling it onto these guys. Uh, one of the things I love about the Giants is they're so big, there's so much skin showing. So most of their skin was done with oil paints. Um, I actually have a few videos from back then where I kind of cover how I did these. But it gives a really nice look. I love doing the skin in oils because it's so easy to do these big, sweeping, smooth transitions. At the same time, you'll notice some of them have things like uh, black blackened veins and things where there's clearly like some kind of infection traveling out, out where this foreign element has attached to their body and now it is infected. Um, the second three pack of babies are all wearing these sort of the skull masks from Knights, which I really like. Thought those worked well. As well, I did many areas of sort of stitched together skin. So all of that is just freehand stitched together skin. And I alternated some of the tones of the skin color, uh, not only being different sort of ethnicities of skin, but also being in different uh, stages of rot or things like that. Um, one thing you'll notice throughout all of the giants is they all have tiny little uh, antennae in their head because I see them as being radio controlled, I guess. Like there is a master controller. There is a Frankenstein behind this um, who has done this work and is now uh, controlling each of these. With the little babies done, let's take a look at the bigs, the, the biggie bigs, uh, the mega gargans, as it were. So there are four of these we're going to look at. Uh, we will start uh, with the War Stompa. And one of the way things I did here to keep them sort of identifiable was keep a sort of major element the same. That way they would always know. So the War Stomper, um, you know, basically has the weapon that would be appropriate for him. So easy to see. Most everything else on these guys has been changed. On the big guys, I have smokestacks and stuff like that because I figure most of their inner guts have been replaced by some kind of engine or something that needs to vent and exhaust. Uh, they all have lots of different 40k bits worked into them. Again, from terrain or from knights. You'll see uh, Imperial Knight feet uh, or legs or arms. You'll see some like crane arms and stuff like that from... Uh, from various 40k terrain pieces. Um, again, all of this skin was done with oils, and this was really a great chance to play with things like infected red areas of the skin to really show all of that wonderful, beautiful texture and to include all these great sweeping colors going down into the, the bright uh, magentas and purples and the different tan colors that it should show in uh, skin of this size. Next up, uh, we're going to take a look at the Gatebreaker. Uh, this guy, I kept the helmet, the head, the, I don't want to call it the headpiece, I guess. But you'll notice instead of like a face, he has horrible, cool mechanical tentacles coming out. Uh, sort of a dark mechanicum look there. And you might notice in the pictures that he has two tiny blue spots as eyes. 
Um, that was one of the more complicated things I ever had to figure out how to do with a model. Because I realized after I had put the head on, so I'd already attached the head, and everything here was like built up with, with glue and stuff, and I'd already put in the tentacles, and then I realized his eyes were just empty black voids, because there's no actual head under there that that, that mask is sitting on. And I was like, well, that looks horrible. So then I figured out what I could do is take a paper clip, flatten it out, make it really long, so I could then stick it in, glue it to the back of the head, like the back of the mask, so a tiny drop of glue on the back of the paper clip, push it inside, and then basically, once the glue had set, cut it with, with clippers right inside the eye hole. So like taking the clippers and snapping right inside the eye hole. Once that was done, it was just like a touch of bright blue paint on each little tip, just bop, bop, to make it look like he has these blue, tiny, glowing eyes in the middle of this otherwise black void. I really love how it came out. Um, it was quite a like crazy problem to solve, and I, I actually like how it how it sort of all worked. So there you go. That's the Gatebreaker. Of course, I have a video about his sword. Um, that's another fun addition. At the time I built him, you could actually give him a giant flaming sword, so I did. Uh, now, of course, that's not an option, but that's okay. I just use that as his big giant flail, and that's fine. It's close enough. Next up is the Kraken Eater. Um, this guy I wanted to give sort of the weird nose to, so he felt more... I don't know, something about it seemed right. I used the helmet with the weird nose piece on it. He still has the um, Kraken Eater's weapon and kind of some other signifying elements from that dude. Uh, you know, this guy was pretty simple. You'll notice here that all of these dudes have basing from the Eidneth ships. Um, I wanted them to be kind of coastal and to have that feeling that they had, that they all were collecting treasure. So I bought, you know, a single sort of Eidneth boat, like one big Eidneth boat, and then just chopped it up into pieces to use uh, as basing for all of them. It worked really well. Like, I still have some of that boat left to this day. It's amazing how much boat you get when you're just breaking it up into basing. And it was a really interesting visual element to put on their giant base to really break up what's otherwise just like way too much flat neutral space. I then piled around treasure crates, you know, piles of gold, sacks of food, all the stuff I would imagine them sort of stealing and hoarding because that's part of their whole thing as they're, you know, they're, they're sort of hoarders, right? Lastly is the, uh, the last edition, I guess, whatever, the final edition chronologically to the army, which was the, uh, which is King Broad. And King Broad is, uh, I've converted, but really like a lot of crazy conversions are on here, including some, I think, 40k Dark Elf bits for his, uh, his one hand, his grippy hand and stuff like that. Uh, this guy, I built the crown out of some different pieces, so he has kind of that ceremonial headdress and stuff like that. Um, but again, using a lot of those knight pieces and stuff like that everywhere I could, uh, to really, like, make this guy feel both special and unique. He's up higher than any of the others, so he, like, stands more visibly tall, uh, on the table by an inch or so an inch and a half, two inches, something like that, than the rest of them. I wanted to communicate that, like, he's the boss, and you just get that through everything on him. Um, again, all these guys were fun, and I really, really, really love this army to this day. Um, it's one of the most fun projects I worked on, because every single model was a huge conversion project that I just got to dump out bits on the desk, and then start literally chopping up this these giant models, and gluing stuff back together and zappa gapping and green stuffing until it all just worked. Uh, so one of my most favorite army projects I've, I've ever done and just a, just a tremendous amount of fun. Army number two, ogres. Uh, this one we won't go quite as deep into. I'm going to run pictures of all the various units here as I'm talking, but the stories are all the same. Uh, so with the ogres, I have, this was a speed painting project. So rather than talk about any of the individual units, there are fun conversions and stuff like that on there uh, within this. But when it comes to things like the ogres, I obviously did, I tried my best to make things like the butcher and the slaughtermaster look interesting. I didn't like him carrying around the big pot. Mine's a paymaster. He's got a big pile of gold he's dragging around. He, you know, chucks money at people to get him to do stuff. I, that was always a thing in the ogres as well. They're very... Um, you know, greedy for lots of different things, obviously. Their big guy rode around on a giant pile of treasure uh, back in the old world. And so uh, I, 
I wanted to sort of convert these guys, clean them up as best I could, but I painted the whole army in a week. So for things like the, and this is a pure Gutbusters army. I don't have any, uh, no monster trucks at all, no Mornfang riders. Um, I've got a buddy who has a BCR army, so we kind of just put our troops together and then we have one really, really big army. But I have, you know, lots of hunters and cats. Um, and those guys were, were fun. Like those are the original metal cats. Oh, so much of this army is still metal. The old tyrant uh, is still metal, as well as I use the other new guy from Curse City as one of my tyrants. So I just really like that ogre. I think he looks awesome. It's, it's an example of how cool they could be in the new sculpt. Um, but I just have lots and lots of the basic troops. And the fun part about doing these guys as a speed paint project over a week was things like doing the tattoos and stuff like that. You think, well, it's a speed paint. Why would you do that kind of thing? Because they're so big and so simple, I was able to do a lot of work with the airbrush. And because I was able to do so much work with the airbrush, it honestly saved me a lot of time to go in and add some extra spicy elements to them, like the tattoos or blood spatters or, you know, just interesting things like that that kept them visually compelling, uh, even though there wasn't a huge amount of time invested. Overall, this, this army probably was 40 or 50 hours of work, but when you figure that, you know, you look at like the, um, the different man-eaters or uh, the gluttons I have, I think, uh, what did I have, what did I do? 20 some gluttons, I don't know exactly the number, but it's somewhere in the 20s range. That's a lot of gluttons. Um, and then, you know, some iron guts and of course, uh, some, some uh, uh, the guys with cannons as well, lead belchers, there you go. I knew we'd get there. Uh, so all in all, these guys were, were fun. I think it's a good example of like the right army, the right models really do lend themselves to speed painting well. Uh, so, you know, for these guys, something like an ogre army, they're simple in construction. It's a lot of flesh and then they're wearing pants. There's not a huge amount of detail or weird fiddly gribbly bits that take a lot of extra time. So you can use more advanced tools. And by the way, it doesn't necessarily mean an airbrush. I could have done the same thing very fast, probably with like oil paints and then just let them dry over the course of the week and then come back in with details. Uh, or I could have done the same thing with like really, uh, you know, sort of dry brushing of, of various kinds and contrast paints. Uh, but in this case, it just meant that you can add those extra really fun elements like the tattoos, like those little things, the freehand elements, because you've got the spare time. And so you get to do something that elevates the army and just makes it more fun as a project. All right, last army. The last army is going to be my Imperial Knights. This is an army I am very, very proud of. Um, all of these knights were done individually over the course of basically three years. Um, they are each probably 150 hour projects, it may be more. Um, each one of them is a very much a labor of love. Uh, now there are many videos on this channel that feature some of the things from these knights. So for example, doing detailed freehand, you're going to see one of these knights coming up. Um, but they are, the, I, even though I, 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 these guys won lots of awards and stuff like that at various painting competitions. Um, I took them to Golden Demon, but they would never win anything there because they're out of IP. The theme of these Imperial Knights was a Sisters of Battle Inquisition Knight Force. And that doesn't really work in the lore, but I don't care. I loved Sisters of Battle. I started these guys before Sisters of Battle had returned, um, like before that was really a thing. Uh, you know, the, the, there was no new plastic sisters. And so this was my take of how I wanted to do that army. Let's start with the little ones. Um, so I have two of your little baby knights. Uh, and these two are just sort of my little Inquisition bots. I added on the extra face plates for them. Um, the freehand on them is relatively simple. Everything, the carapace to me is just a wonderful opportunity to do tons of freehand. These are meant to have the Sisters of Battle iconography, the Inquisition iconography, the Ecclesiarchy's iconography, things like that. I just drew from, you know, sort of across that entire, um, space. To, to build up the patterns here, using things like roses and vines and inquisition symbols and the fleur de lis and all of those kinds of things in a mix. In my story, in my head, in my 40k universe, it works just fine. So, uh, but the little ones aren't anything that special. They were both really relatively simple projects. They certainly weren't 150 hours. Um, the little ones were just there to kind of round out the army. But now let's get to the real, let's get to the actual action here. So first up is the most simple knight, basically built quite directly. Um, one thing is I didn't use any of the 
um, sort of like top mounted missile launchers on the two normal ones because I wanted maximum space to do freehand art. And every armor panel on these guys is just luxuriated with freehand. And each time I would just take every armor panel individually and think, what cool thing do I want to do here? Uh, so with this one, it was a big giant piece of Saint, a big giant piece of art of Saint Celestine. Uh, and I thought this was just a really cool piece of art that I really loved. And so I love angels. Celestine's basically like an angel, um, for the Sisters of Battle. So it was perfect. And so I just, you know, spent a lot of time doing that onto the carapace. And then again, with different freehand images, trace all of the thing. Sometimes keeping it very simple, just simple fleur de lis or patterns or things like that, or the roses. And then sometimes getting way more complicated um, with what might be over there as far as like skulls with flaming eyes and stuff like that. This was the first one I did. Not the first night I ever painted, but the first one I did specifically for this purpose. And I just, all of these have a very special place in my heart. Um, they're things that I think I, I still look at to this day and cherish. Night number two was a bit of a different construction project. When they released the first sort of resin sister, the one based off of the John Blanche art, one of my favorite pieces of art of all time from the old Codex, uh, I thought, what a cool idea to take a knight, put her on the front, um, as though she was like a Repentia sister who needed to be strapped into, you know, their big robots for, for penance or whatever. But instead of being a punishment, this was a reward. Like, she got this knight for, for service in battle, basically. So she still has her armor. Um, kind of like how the Grey Knights have that little their little boy strapped into the little baby carrier. And so you'll notice she is, like, standing in a position on her little... On her thing that's holding her up there. And there's, like, tubes and wires and little foot mount things for her. She's in a certain position, and her knight is matching her in the same position. Like, she's holding her gun up in the air to her right. The knight is holding its machine gun up in the air to the right. She's holding her sword down at an angle. The knight is holding its chainsword down. I also modified the chainsword to be actually held. It's not on the arm. The knight has a full hand and fist, like it has the sort of shot gauntlet. But then that gauntlet is wrapped around a handle that is a chainsword. So I took the chainsword and actually made it into a literal held sword. Uh, in the thing's hand. This thing had so much conversion work done on it. And it was just a lot of fun to do to like replace her in there and, you know, draw like the tubes and reshape the thing. And I really love this model. Like, I know it's a completely goofball idea and has no basis in the lore whatsoever. But like, isn't this why you play war games to make a model like this? Uh, like, I could just picture her walking around the battlefield and as she's like, pointing and shooting the big knight then matches her shots and as she swings it swings right like sort of mimicking what's happening and in my head that's just so awesome uh i can't explain why i just i love robots and i love the sisters of battle and this combined the two of them i guess the final knight in uh this in my in my sister's knight army um the last one was one of the last ones i did this is obviously one of the bigger knights the dominus frame or whatever and uh, this one was just like really a, an experiment in doing like super advanced sort of freehand over all of the things. Uh, another fun, and, and like you can see all the panels in this, there's, there was, it's a more interesting sort of space to work with. It's wider, but more shallow. So hence the um, Aquila was kind of the, the right choice here because it kind of spread out nicely in the space. I think by this point, I had really like refined a lot of my work on doing flaming skulls and stuff like that so you'll notice a lot more of those elements there's also a lot of small touches to the individual freehand and things like that um the fun part about this one is the sort of missile that's launching out i wanted to actually do a missile launching and so i uh, took the missile and drilled in a big paper clip and then ran that back into the the launch pod like into the actual bay um, and then, like, built the smoke out of... The smoke is actually um, tree flock, like, model railroad trees. I just plucked a bunch of it off of the trees and then, pri like, stuck it all around the paper clip, primed it, painted it, and then, you know, put in the heat effects and stuff like that near the launch. So that was just a really fun, cool idea for, like, a missile launch. Um, I think I could do that again. I don't think it looks bad. I think it actually looks kind of fun. It's still close by. I think you get the nice smoke effect. So... All in all, I thought it came together pretty cool. So there you go. There's my three armies. Uh, what do you think of them? Give me some feedback. 
Uh, you know, did you like anything? Is there any figure that stood out to you? Hit me down in the comments below. If you like this series, you know, tell me, should I keep doing this? Should I keep going through my armies? The reaction to the first one was pretty positive, but I don't know if people are going to keep liking this series or not. If you did like it, hey, hit that like button. It helps other people find it. Um, if you've got any questions about anything I did with any of these models and you want to know how I did any of the techniques, hit me up. Answer, hit me down in the questions. I always answer every question and comment that's been asked. Happy to do so here as well and, and help put you on the road if you liked anything I did and you want to use the same techniques. Um, subscribe for new hobby cheating videos. We'll be back to techniques and painting next week. Uh, we have new videos here every Saturday. If you want to support the channel, lots of ways you can do so. There's some Amazon links down below. So if you're going to buy anything for your hobby, you can buy down there. It doesn't cost you anything extra. Kicks back some money to the channel. Um, there's a merch store down there that you can pick up a game that Uncle Adam and I do. Uh, and so you can find links to all of our games below. And of course, you can join me on Patreon. Uh, our Patreon are, is focused on review and feedback and taking your next step on your hobby journey. Maybe you've got an army you're trying to get done. I'd love to help you complete that army um, through the Patreon. So, uh, as always, I thank you so much for watching this one, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.